Okay, hello. So today we, hope we have Julie Rowlett from Chalmers University of Technology and Julie is going to talk about the mathematics of hearing the shape of a drum. Julie, thank you very much for being with us today and we are listening to you. Thank you so much for, for the invitation um, and it's nice to virtually meet all of you. Um, so I'd like to welcome everyone to Feel free to ask questions um, at any time. And if you're at all shy, you can ask a question directly to me in the chat. So um, I'll just answer the question without saying who asked it, if you're shy. Um, this is a bit more of a survey talk, um, not focused only on my own work, but also on, on the work of lots of, of um, researchers. So hopefully something will connect to your own interests along the way. So let's see if I can share the screen. And do a full screen. Um, Is this working? Are you seeing my slides or? Yes, yes. Oh, you do. Okay. It seems it Zoom is telling me screen sharing is paused, but. No, we are perfect to fine here. Okay. Uh -huh. Good. Thanks. Okay. So here's a picture of Mark Katz who probably you've heard this question, can one hear the shape of a drum? And this is actually, it sounds rather simple, but it turns out that answering this question is not so mathematically easy. So we're gonna start with an easier question. And that is, can one hear the length of a string? So you're probably all familiar with the sounds of vibrating strings. Um, for instance, there are vibrating vocal cords right now that you're hearing through your computers. And the strings inside a lot of uh, our favorite instruments also vibrate and create noise. Um, and in fact, there's a mathematical reason that may explain why a vibrating string has a particularly pleasant sound. So, um, are we seeing a page with a picture of cats? No, Julie, actually we are just uh, seeing the first page of your presentation. We don't see any cats right now. Okay, so you're not seeing different pages? This no. Is okay, let me try this again. Okay. Okay, so now you're seeing it. Yes. Now we are seeing a page uh, titled Touch Question. Is it correct? Yes. Okay. And you can make it full screen if you, you may. Full screen mode. Yeah. Yeah, that is what I just did. And then it said screen sharing was paused when I did that. But let's see if it works now. It says your screen sharing is paused. Okay, then we can go uh, without the full screen. I don't know. Now we have a picture of Professor Catch as far as I see, mm -hmm. correct? Maybe you can stop share and reshare re your screen. Yeah. Do you see now equations? Uh, no, we don't see any equations. We are just uh, on this second page of your presentation. Okay. How about 
Yeah, yes. now we have the equations. Okay, good. Okay, and we have full screen. <laughs> so um, this is a mathematization of a vibrating string. The first equation is the wave equation, which, so the function u is the height of the string at the time t and position x. And so we mathematize the string by identifying it with an interval of length l. And then, so we think of the height zero as being a neutral height. So if, if the height is zero, then your string is not moving. And then if it's above, then it's a, a positive displacement and negative is a is displacement below. And so in a string like on a guitar or a piano, um, the ends don't move. And so the height remains that neutral height zero. And so mathematically, this is called the Dirichlet boundary condition. And it simply means that this function, the height of the string is zero at the two endpoints. And then when you have your vibrating string, if you consider starting from some initial time, then there's an initial position of the string described by the function f and initial velocity of the string described by the function g. So I have a few exercises throughout this talk. The first one is how do we solve this equation? What should we do first? I have one of my students here, so <laughs> I could I could call out, but uh, any any thoughts? Okay, well maybe it was a while ago since you you studied this, but uh, we'll separate variables. So it's simply a means to an end. Assume that the function u is a product of a function strictly dependent on x, not on t, times a function that depends only on t. So when we put, put that into the partial differential equation, it turns the partial differential equation into basically an equation with ordinary derivatives. And if you move all of the t-dependent stuff to one side and all of the space-dependent stuff to the other side, then what can you conclude about the two sides? They depend on different variables, so they must both be constants. And so you therefore reduce solving a partial differential equation into solving ordinary differential equations. And um, I've been actually working on a book based on the course I teach in Fourier analysis. And one of the novelties is I have little rhymes. So here, we have this constant. So both sides are equal to a constant, which we call lambda. So to figure out what lambda needs to be, the boundary conditions will help us see what the values of lambda needs to be. And so indeed, we have this equation for the space-dependent function x and these boundary conditions requiring that it's zero at the two ends, meaning the ends aren't moving. And therefore, we can solve this and obtain all of the possible values of lambda. And these lambdas are eigenvalues. The corresponding function x is the eigenfunction. And the set of all lambdas is the spectrum. And these numbers are basically determining the sound of, this, of the string. And so for that reason, we say that anything that's determined by the spectrum can be heard. So the first question was, can we hear the length of the string? Well, when we solve this, the eigenvalues are square integer multiples of pi squared divided by the length squared. And the corresponding eigenfunctions are signs. So if we know these eigenvalues, then we know lambda. OK, so we can hear the length of the string. But if you asked, I don't know, 
a kid, whether you can hear the length of the string, if they just thought about playing the piano or a violin or a guitar, they would tell you, of course, because you hit the, the keys down on the end of the piano with the longer strings or the, sh the shorter strings actually, and they're low and you, or no, the longer strings are, are low and then the shorter strings are high. Um, because you see here, if lambda becomes small, these eigenvalues, which are in basically bijection with the frequencies go up. So short strings, higher tones, long strings, lower tones. And so in particular, you can hear the length of a string. If two strings are vibrating, either they're going to have the same eigenvalues or different ones. So you can hear if one's longer or shorter or the same length. So you can hear the length of the string and you can do it just using calculus. So one of the mathematicians who inspired cats was Milner was shown here, who wrote an article in 1961 in Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, which is one page long, very pleasant short read. And his article um, of this mere one page answered the question, which sounds, this is funny because this question sounds more sophisticated and maybe more difficult. Can one hear the shape of a Romanian manifold? Well, actually that question can be answered very quickly um, thanks to Milner. So to put it into mathematical terms, the question is if two Romanian manifolds have the same spectrum, are they isometric? Are they essentially the same shape? So this comes from also solving the wave equation in an analogous way. You separate the space variables from the time variables, and then you end up with one side depending only on space, one side depending only on time, ergo both sides are constant. And then when you unravel the space part, what it looks like is the Laplacian of F plus lambda F is zero. If your manifold has a boundary, or if you're looking at a domain in the plane, then you impose a boundary condition. For example, the Dirichlet boundary condition, which would be requiring that your function vanishes at the boundary. And, and then you look for the eigenvalues lambda and the eigenfunctions F to solve this equation. And here I've given the Laplacian and local coordinates, um, but if you prefer, you can just imagine it as being a geometric generalization of just your standard Euclidean Laplacian and Rn, which is the sum of all the second partial derivatives in each of the coordinate directions. So, do we know the answer to this question? Before I get to it, let's keep the suspense for just a moment. Um, these questions are in general quite difficult because a string is a very, very special and simple example we can solve for the eigenvalues and the eigenfunctions explicitly. And they're quite simple and neat and tidy. Um, and one of the reasons that a string may sound particularly nice is because all of the eigenvalues are square integer multiples of the smallest one. So they have this neat and tidy structure, which means that the fundamental tone and the higher harmonics also reflect this structure and they sound pretty. But in general, you can't do this. So we can say qualitative, we can prove qualitative statements about the eigenvalues, but we cannot say exactly what they are. So it's difficult then to say, well, if I have this set of numbers and I don't know what they are, and I have this other set of numbers and I don't know what those are either, then are the manifolds isometric? But there are some examples where we can compute, and, and one of those is, is flat torus. So flat torus is 
a quotient of Euclidean space by a full rank lattice. And the spectrum of the Ramanian manifold obtained by taking this quotient, so this um, torus, is just four times pi squared times the length of vectors squared in the dual lattice. So in that sense, you can actually compute the spectrum of a torus. And then the eigenvalues are just linear combinations of e to the two pi i, say if x is the variable of dependence, x dot the element of the dual lattice. And then these can be taken um, summed for elements in the dual lattice that have the same length. So the multiplicity of each eigenvalue is the number of elements of the dual lattice that have the same length. Okay, so what did Milner do? Milner created what I'll call a duet. Um, Milner showed that there are two 16 dimensional flat tori that are isospectral. So they have exactly the same eigenvalues, um, but they're different shapes. They are not isometric. So what are these? Well, one is obtained by taking the quotient of R16 by the lattice E16. And the second one is you take the quotient by the product E8 with E8. Now, this second example is also, as a Ramanian manifold, a product, whereas E16 is an irreducible lattice and the corresponding flat tori, torus is irreducible. It could never be expressed as a product. That's really what reducible versus irreducible means. And so they, they're not isometric. They're just geometrically distinguishable in that sense, but they have exactly the same spectrum. So that's why I call them a duet because you can imagine if you're listening, they sing in perfect unison. It's perhaps not the most interesting duet. I mean, harmonies might be nicer, but these ones are in unison. So how do you, how do you prove that they're isospectral? Um, it's not so immediately obvious. If I go back here, you have these dual lattices and then you have these lengths of vectors in the dual lattices and verifying that all of these lengths are identical and that the multiplicities of the different lengths is an infinite task because there's, there's infinitely many checks one would need to do. So that's not really feasible. So how does one do this? Um, so first of all, as I said in the very beginning, we say that you can hear anything that's determined by the spectrum. And you could also equivalently call such a quantity a spectral invariant. So the very first spectral invariants were discovered by Hammond Weil in 1912. And he proved that the dimension and the volume are spectral invariants. So although we cannot compute these eigenvalues in general explicitly, we can prove that on a compact manifold, they are, with my sign convention, um, non-negative, discrete, and they accumulate at infinity at a rate determined by the dimension of the manifold and its volume. And therefore, if you know all of these eigenvalues, you know how they tend towards infinity. And so you know the dimension of your manifold and you know its volume. So, if two flat tori are isospectral, then they have the same dimension and they're the same volume. Moreover, looking at 
the expression for the eigenvalues flat tori or isospectral if and only if they're dual tori. So the tori obtained by taking the quotient by the dual lattice, if those are isospectral. And a spectral invariant associated with a flat torus um, is called the theta series. So you sum over the elements of the lattice, e to the i pi z length of the lattice vector squared. And this is thanks to Weil's law, um, which says how these lengths tend to infinity. This converges beautifully for complex Z with positive imaginary part. Um, and ah, so in particular, if we enumerate the eigenvalues for an n-dimensional compact Ramani manifold or a bounded domain, then if we enumerate them in increasing order, um, counting multiplicity, then the kth one grows on the order of k to the power two divided by n. So if you remember in one dimension, the eigenvalues were square integer multiples of pi squared divided by the length of the string. So the kth one is growing like a squared, exactly. And then they grow more slowly as the dimension goes higher. They grow in the order of k to the two divided by n. Um, and so that, knowing that they grow like that, then tells you that this series converges beautifully in the upper half space. Um, and these lattices, E16 and the product E8 times E8 are even and unimodular. And there's a big uh, theorem in number theory that says, oh, well, then their theta series are modular forms for PSL2Z. I'm not a number theorist, so I can only quote the theorem, but in 16 dimension, there's only one such form up to multiplication by scalars. So um, they, they have the same theta series, these two, these two flat tori, which shows that if you look at this expression for the theta series, if this coincides, it's a little exercise to prove then that the corresponding flat tori are isospectral. Um, so this is how you prove isospectrality without actually computing all of the individual eigenvalues. I, I find this rather beautiful because it takes this spectral theory problem and turns it into uh, something that's answered with number theoretic techniques. Does anybody have any questions at this point? Okay, so you cannot hear the shape of a Ramanian manifold in general. And to connect back to Katz's question, okay, what about the very specific example of bounded domains in the plane? If two bounded domains in the plane are isospectral, then are they perhaps the same shape? Because if you imagine a real drum, the surface which vibrates is like a bounded domain in the plane. So if two actual real physical drums made of the same material are vibrating and making sound, and you hear them with your perfect ear that picks up all of the frequencies, the fundamental tone and all of the higher harmonics, and they sound exactly the same, then are they the same shape? That's Katz's question. And if your drums are allowed to be um, just arbitrary Ramanian manifolds, then the answer is no. But if you require that they're actually like real drums, this is 
this is going to take a little bit more work to answer that question. So this is, in that sense, one of the reasons that um, Milner's work helped to inspire cats. Okay, so but I want to I want to focus a little bit on flash Torai, and um, all good things come in threes. Uh, I Google translated that. I don't speak Turkish at all, but this is a this is a saying that um, exists in German and in Swedish. Alle gute Dinge, alle gute Dinge sind drei für die, die Deutsch sprechen. Um, there's I think there's one other Swedish speaker. Um, um, and I, th I think we say it in English too, but also in math, we often, we really, really often have like a classification of things into three types. So here, there's going to be a little bit of a theme of threes going on in this part. Um, so even though you can, in some sense, actually compute the spectrum of black tori, there's still, in fact, a lot of open questions about them. So to address um, one of these questions, we define this choir number. So I talked about the perfectly isospectral black tori as being a duet. But more generally, we can ask, well, how many isospectral non-isometric flat tori can make a perfect unison choir. Um, so we define these choir numbers in each dimension to be the maximal number of isospectral but non-isometric flat tori. And good things come in threes. So there's three different equivalent formulations of this. The first one is analytic perhaps. The second one is number theoretic. So it can be posed in terms of um, non-intricately equivalent uh, positive definite quadratic forms. And the third one is geometric in terms of the lattices that define the flat tori. So how large of a unison flat torus choir can we have in each dimension? Well, this was proven actually fairly recently in 1991. Now, proving that any two one-dimensional flat tori that are isospectral are basically the same is, is an exercise in calculus. It's basically the same thing we did with the string. We just changed the boundary condition to be a periodic boundary condition. And so then if two flat tori in one dimension are isospectral, they're, they're the same. In two dimensions, it's slightly more difficult, slightly, but still pretty easy. However, to prove this in three dimensions is extremely difficult. So this was done by Alexander Schiemann in 1991. And it's a result that's not so widely known. Um, did, is anyone here familiar with this? So one of the reasons the result, there's actually two, two big reasons the result is not widely known. The first is that the paper, which was published, which contains this result, never mentions the word flat torus, the word spectrum, the word eigenvalue, isometric. None of these words are ever mentioned in that paper. Um, it's all phrased in number theoretic language. So if you don't know the equivalence, the linguistic equivalence of these terms, then you wouldn't know that that result is contained in that paper. He does have a proof of this result explaining the, the spectral interpretation for Tori, but that's only in his PhD thesis, which is possible to find, but it's in German and in Germany. 
So um, it's not very widely known. And it's the proof requires a computer algorithm. So this is actually an open problem to create a proof by hand without a computer. No one has achieved that to date. Um, so if you're interested, we have my students, um, Eric Nielsen and Felix Rydell, we wrote a mostly survey article about the isospectral problem for flat tori. And we described the different perspectives and the equivalences and how different techniques from number theory and coding theory um, can all be used to investigate these, these questions. And there's a lot of open problems. So uh, if, if you're curious, um, please check that out. It's on the archive um, and will be published in Bulletin of the American Mass Society. So for example, proving that three-dimensional flat tori, which are isospectral, are isometric without a computer algorithm, that's an open problem. Um, and another open problem is what are the values of these flat choir numbers? So it has been demonstrated that there are pairs of isospectral non-isometric flat tori in dimensions four and higher, but are there only duets? Are there triplets? Uh, or I don't know if that's the correct musical term, but are there larger choirs that sing in perfect unison? Unknown. There are no examples. So, um, or no proofs that there's only two. Um, we did obtain a lower bound, which is not the hardest thing in the world to do. So, th so this, this grows. So the number of, uh, so definitely the, the choir numbers will tend to infinity as n goes to infinity, but exactly what they are is a, is a wide open problem. Okay, so here's a picture, um, which I thought you you might enjoy. And this is a C1 isometric embedding of two dimensional flat torus into R3. Um, so it's sort of like a smooth fractal. And this was obtained by Borelli and co authors in 2012, um, published in Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. So I think that's kind of interesting um, what that looks like. So as I mentioned before, the eigenfunctions are linear combinations of these basically plane waves um, for values or for vectors in the dual lattice that have the same length. And the multiplicity of each eigenvalue is the number of vectors in the dual lattice that have the same length. So as we calculated the eigenvalues of a string, we can do the exact same thing to calculate the eigenvalues of an n-dimensional Euclidean box because it is the product of these one-dimensional intervals. So essentially you can separate variables and your eigenvalues are the sums of the eigenvalues in each of the different orthogonal directions. And the eigenfunctions are the products of the eigenfunctions in each of the intervals. Therefore, as we saw before, if we, for example, take the Dirichlet boundary condition, then eigenfunctions are trigonometric functions, sines. If we took the Neumann boundary condition, we'd get cosines. So a natural question could be, is this, is this typical? So this is something that I've also thought about with my students, um, Max Bloom, Henrik Mordell, Oliver Tim, and Jack Van Berry uh, in a paper that's published in the American Math Monthly last year. So this question we answer only for polytopes. 
In two dimension, a polytope is a polygonal domain. And in higher dimensions, a polytope is just a bounded domain with flat boundary faces. It does not need to be convex. It just has to have flat boundary faces. So what we proved is um, an equivalence of three things. Again, good things coming in threes. The first statement is that if you have your, since we can enumerate the eigenvalues um, from smallest to largest as they are discrete, and with the Dirichlet boundary condition, the first eigenvalue is positive strictly. We can talk about the first eigenfunction since the first eigenvalue also has, it is simple. It has multiplicity one. So up to scale, the first eigenfunction is well-defined. And it's, it satisfies the PDE in the domain. And the first statement is if this extends to the entire space to be a real analytic function on Rn, then an equivalent statement is that this polytope strictly tessellates space. I'll show you what that means and give you a picture on the next slide. Um, and that's equivalent. So this second condition is a purely geometric statement about the polytope, something that it geometrically does, a way that it, it fills space through tessellation in a specific way. Um, essentially, it fills space by reflection. And then the strict part is that since it has flat boundary faces, if you extend the boundary faces of each copy of the polytope in the tessellation, those extended hyperplanes cannot cut through any of the other polytopes in the tessellation. Again, I'll show you a picture though. So that's a geometric statement. And the third one is an algebraic statement um, that the domain is congruent to a fundamental domain of the crystallographic Coxeter group, um, which is something also known in the literature as an alcove. So these three statements are equivalent. And if any of them hold, then all of the eigenfunctions of the polytope are trigonometric functions. So that's a answer to the question, how common are trigonometric eigenfunctions? As I will show you in the next slide, strict tessellation is a very special geometric property. So on the left, you can see an equilateral triangle. And this strictly tessellates the plane. You reflect over the boundary faces, and you can fill out the plane without any overlap, which is what a tessellation is. But moreover, when you extend the edges of the triangles in the tessellation, they never cut through the interior of any of the triangles in the tessellation. So if you see on the right, hexagons, they also tessellate, but they're not strict because when you extend the boundary edges, it, in this case, it's two dimensions. So it's the line, these lines, containing the boundary segments will cut through the hexagons in the tessellation. Um, parallelograms also tessellate the plane, but it's not strict because if you think of, they tessellate by tra translation. If you take a parallelogram and then you flip it, then you'll get this sort of overlap, which causes it not to be a tessellation by reflection. It's a tessellation by translation. So that's not a strict tessellation. So uh, fun question. Up to congruency, how many kinds of strictly tessellating polygons are there in R2? Any guesses?
I guess according to the title of the section, the answer should be three, but there's actually four. Um, so equilateral triangles, yes. Now, if you split an equilateral triangle in half, that will work as well. Um, rectangles and uh, isosceles right triangles. Those are the only four types of polygons that strictly tessellate in R2. So this is actually a pretty rare property. in R2. So having trigonometric eigenfunctions is not common, in fact. Um, but in higher dimensions, there's this is also an open question. How many congruency classes of strictly tessellating polytopes are there? Unknown. It's related to the classification of crystallographic groups. So it's known that in each dimension, there are finitely many um, up to congruency crystallographic or uh, groups, but it's not known exactly how many there are in each dimension. And this is also open for Neumann boundary condition and related to the hotspots conjecture. So the process of answering Katz's question, if two bounded domains in the plane are isospectral, are they the same shape? There was progress made over many years um, with the biggest advance made in the 1980s with the discovery of the Sunata method. And this is a method to construct isospectral, non isometric, four dimensional Riemannian manifolds, also coming from number theoric ideas. And so eventually, Buzer was able to use this method to obtain examples in two dimensions, but they weren't flat. And finally, in 1991, Gordon Webb and Wolpert answered Katz's question by showing that these domains, so the original pair is the one on the right, and a slightly more simple construction is the one on the left. But you can see that are not the same shape. And Using a generalization of the Sonata method, one can prove that they are isospectral. So, any observations about them geometrically? They're not convex, very much not convex. And they're pointy, they don't have smooth boundaries. So, these are, again, more open problems. If two domains are required to be convex and they're isospectral, are they the same shape? Not known. If they have smooth boundaries, also an open problem. And then also an open problem is how many? So we always find pairs, but are there triplets, quadruplets? And analogous to the to the question about the choir numbers. So now I want to briefly mention some results about what we can here. Um, so with my co-authors, Jishin Liu, and then later with Medet Nursultanov, my student, and David Scher, my mathematical brother, uh, we proved that basically corners are a spectral invariant. So these funny domains could never be isospectral to a smoothly bounded domain. Um, and this is essentially done by studying the short time asymptotic expansion of the heat trace. Um, I don't wanna get too technical and I, I think I'm supposed to be, it's 45 minutes, right? Yeah. So. I'll, I'll just say it's heat trace proof. And if anyone's curious, I'd be very happy to explain the details of it. Um, so another thing you can hear is symmetry. So if we're also, if we're, if we're thinking about polygons in the plane, 
if an arbitrary shaped polygon is isospectral to a regular one, then they're actually the same shape. So you can hear the regular end gone. And you can even do it with a realistic ear, meaning you only need a finite part of the spectrum to distinguish the regularity of a regular end gone. Um, you can hear the shapes of triangles. So isospectral triangles um, are isometric. You can hear not smoothly bounded domains, but domains with an analytic boundary and a mirror symmetry. And you can hear trapezoids. Um, so this is a little bit about the details of the proofs, but I'm gonna skip that. And so quantifying isospectral sets of Riemannian metrics is an open problem in general, but for the case of smooth surfaces, um, a compactness result was obtained by Osgood Phillips and Sarnak used by studying the spectral zeta function and proving that it has a monotone behavior along the Ricci flow. Um, so I'll end there. Thank you. Your questions and comments you. are most welcome. Thank you very much, Julie. Uh, anyone questions or comments, please? No questions, no comments for Julie. I actually, I just want to agree with one sentence and uh, it is that the inner spectral problems are hard. I just want to say that. Thanks, Embusha, for the comments. Any other questions or comments? Okay, we can call it a day if there is no yeah. more questions. Buterin, Buterin wants to say. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry, I'm sorry. Asking question, but I was muted. Mm -hmm. So I was uh, late. I'm sorry. I will probably see this seminar in uh, record. Yeah. But uh, I just want to uh, have one question. If, uh, if one can hear the shape of the drum or not. <laughs> no. <laughs> what, what, what is conclusion? <laughs> the conclusion was back here. Uh -huh. So so it's uh, complicated. Um, so these ones, so you can see that they're different shapes. So verifying that they're different shapes is the easy part, right? And verifying that they have identical spectrum mm -hmm. essentially, so way back with, uh, did you, were you here for the Tori in the beginning? He was not here, I guess. Okay. So one of the ways to show, because right, you have infinitely many eigenvalues. So checking that they're all the same seems impossible, right? So you don't do that. <laughs> you don't want to do that. You don't do it. So instead you look at, um, for example, here, you see this heat trace. Perhaps you can show that this function is identical for both, just as an example. Uh, okay, if this function is identical for both, then you look at the asymptotic behavior as t goes to infinity. That's governed by the smallest eigenvalue. So then the smallest eigenvalue is the same for both. And then, oh, well, then the next term in the asymptotic behavior as t goes to infinity is also the same. So then lambda two is the same. And then you just keep going and you get that they're isospectral. And so sometimes, for example, with flat tori, this heat trace is um, a theta series, which is an object in also studied in number theory, evaluated at a certain point. And then you have results, for example, in number theory that say, oh, um, in such and such dimensions, there's only up to equivalence uh, 
one such theta series. So you use some other techniques to then say, oh, these spectral invariants are the same. Therefore, all the eigenvalues are the same. Therefore, your things are isospectral without ever computing the actual eigenvalues. But such type of, uh, of series uh, arise in uh, uh, heat processes and diffusion, diff diffusion processes, but not in uh, wave propagation or not? It's the same lambdas. These lambdas are the same ah, for heat propagation and for... Yes, lambdas are, lambdas are, the, same, are the same. Yes, I agree, of course. It's... And so for waves, another, another quantity you can look at is the wave trace, which is, um, it's only a tempered distribution. It doesn't converge, as you can see. But then you could study that object and hope to say things. So in, in our case, for proving um, isometry, we look at this spectral invariant because as a tempered distribution, it has singularities. And the singularities of it, well, sometimes, the times when it's singular are actually geometric information. They're the lengths of closed geodesics. Thank you very much. Thank you very Any other much. questions? I ask a question. Yes, please. Do you have uh, Borg type theorems in this setting? I mean, even if we cannot hear the shape from one set of eigenvalues, if, if we are given more than one set of eigenvalues corresponding to different boundary conditions, can we have uniqueness in that case? Mm, so if you knew like both, say, Dirichlet values and Neumann? Yeah, like, for, yeah, for, for example. I don't think you would get much more from that, actually. Um, if you think about these, the information that you get out of, for example, heat and wave traces is more or less the same for those different boundary conditions. Um, but maybe if you had like a parameterized family, you could hope to obtain more. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brock. Any other questions or comments? Uh, may I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, uh, as, as far as I understood, uh, you have such a result uh, that uh, if uh, the spectrum of uh, some algon uh, uh, of, uh, is equal to the spectrum of uh, the uh, regular uh, algon, uh, then uh, these polygons are the same. Uh, is uh, the same result for uh, the circle? For example, if uh, so, some domain is either spectral to the circle, are they the same? This is a great question, and the answer is yes. Mm. Is it your result? No. <laughs> it's it's a class like um, basically Faber Cron uh, from 1920. So mm. it's like 100 years. Mm -hmm. And it comes from actually this heat trace expansion, you see? So if you're isospectral, then you have the same heat trace because the lambdas are the same. And so then you have the same behavior. I didn't write it. This is for, did I write it for small time? Um, this is for T tending to zero. So you can see the series is gonna blow up when T tends to zero and it blows up in a very particular way. Minus is for Dirichlet boundary plus is for Neumann. And that's a little bit related to what I meant about you get kind of the same information. Um, so we know that the ratio area versus perimeter squared is among all domains maximized by a disk. Mm -hmm. So if you had the same lambdas, you would have the same asymptotic behavior. So then this ratio of area to perimeter, you'd have the same area, you'd have the mm -hmm. same perimeter, then you'd have that same isoparametric constant, then you'd have to be a disk. And then because you'd have to have the exact same area, you'd have to be the exact same disk. <laughs> yeah, I see, thank you. And uh, what about the n-dimensional case? Is it the same situation? 
when we have an n-dimensional ball? Um, I think so. Because we have the same. So in n dimensions, the first term here would be volume. Mm -hmm. And then the stuff downstairs would be 4 pi t to the dimension divided by 2. If your dimension is 2, that's why you don't see that quantity. Mm -hmm. But you'd have volume upstairs. So if you were isospectral, you'd have the same volume. And then the next term is the n minus 1 dimensional volume of the boundary. So those two terms would have to be the same. So then your isoparametric ratio would have to be the same. And I believe we have the same isoparametric fact for balls. Yeah, I see it would be the same. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank there you. There are some results that say that um, there's some sort of spectral rigidity. Um, so if you kind of just perturb Uh, I don't know that I would say it, but there's also a spectral rigidity for such type, uh, not just disks, but like ellipses. Um, that's some recent work by uh, Steve Zeldich and Hamid Hazari, which is a sort of related question. Uh, and what if uh, in the dimension two, uh, we have a ring? So uh, the two circle, uh, the, um, uh, this region between two circles. Like an annulus? Uh, uh, a ring. I, I think between between uh, uh, between two circles. Mm -hmm. Um, and what's the question about it? Uh, the question is, uh, can we hear it? <laughs> can ah. we hear the shape? I don't think so off the top of my head. I don't think you can, but there are some really interesting results about, um, so when you have a disc or, mm -hmm. or like you're describing a ring, mm -hmm. you can compute the eigenvalues and the eigenfunctions in terms of zeros of Bessel functions. And there are some really interesting results about limitations on the multiplicities that mm -hmm. go back to some number theory um, results about uh, independence, uh, algebraic independence of zeros of Bessel functions and things. It's, um, but I don't, I don't think because, yeah, I don't think that it's enough information to be able to hear that it's a, it's a ring. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So I want to ask Natalia. Natalia, the, 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 do you mean that uh, if one can uh, hear the hole inside the uh, disk? Yes. Oh, you can I hear the. the uh, I mean the all this form, uh, uh, the, the radius of the. Uh, oh, uh, namely radius. All the, all this figure, not not only the hole. Just the existence of a hole in uh, inside. Maybe it's another, another, so another task. Yes, uh, there may be, I think here, uh, there can be different pro problem statements. You can hear that there is a hole. But so no. that, is, that is a spectral invariant. It comes in the next term that I didn't write. Uh, can one hear a shape of this hole? But you <laughs> cannot hear the whole shape, as she's saying, like, if, if you can't say that's a ring, that one is a ring. <laughs> but what is the shape? It's unclear. Yeah. Or you can't say that a ring just doesn't topological. sound like some funny shaped thing. Just topological structure. But Not you can say it has a hole. Yeah. OK, hey, thank you. Any other questions or comments, anyone? If not, then Julie, thank you so much for being with us today. It really means a lot for us. So, and thanks a lot for joining our seminar and see you next time, everyone. Julie, thank, thank you so much again.